Good evening. Welcome to Westminster Libraries for tonight's event, the most boring film ever made. My name is Nikki. Um, my colleague behind the scenes is Lola. And just appearing on camera is Glyn Davis, who's the star of the show. Um, Glyn Davis is currently reader in film studies at the University of Edinburgh. But in fact, this is possibly his last event for them because he's about to move to be a professor at St Andrews. Um, Glyn has written widely on film. Uh, he's written on books on um, pop cinema and Karen Carpenter. And um, he is project leader on a, a project called Cruising the 70s, unearthing pre-HIV and AIDS queer sexual cultures. So I think we're going to be in for a very quirky evening. evening. Um, if you, um, Glenn is going to talk for about half an hour, 45 minutes. Um, I'm not quite sure, it depends how, how interesting these boring films are. Um, there'll be an opportunity to, there, there's an opportunity for you to ask questions through the Q&A at the bottom of the screen. So please type any questions or comments you have in that. Okay, over to you, Glenn. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Nikki. And uh, it's really great to be here this evening. Thank you so much for the invite to deliver this talk. I'm now wishing that I had a little icon of myself that was a picture of Big Ben. Why do I not have one of those? Um, yes, as uh, as Nikki has just said, I am currently based at the University of Edinburgh, but will be, um, I actually, I'm in the, my final month of working for, for that institution. Um, I'm going to be talking for about 40 minutes or so. I have a couple of clips to show, and I should say that the clips are not embedded into the PowerPoint, so I will have very quick um, transitions between PowerPoint slides and a couple of clips to show you. The clips are boring, or are they? Actually, we can talk about that later, whether you found the clips boring or not. I'll tell you what they are when we get to them. What's the most tedious movie you've ever sat through? How dull does a film have to be before you walk out or switch it off, um, before your tolerance has been tested? I want to start with just two brief anecdotes, anecdotal examples from um, journalists. Uh, the first is from Roger Ebert. In May of 2003, he wrote, I walked out of the press screening of Vincent Gallo's film, The Brown Bunny at the Cannes Film Festival. And I was asked by a camera crew what I thought of the film. I said, I thought it was the worst film in the history of the festival. That was hyperbole. I hadn't seen every film in the history of the festival, but I was still vibrating from one of the most disastrous screenings I had ever attended. Imagine, I wrote in, he wrote in his review, a film so unendurably boring that when the hero changes into a clean shirt, there is applause. If you've seen The Brown Bunny, we can talk about this uh, later on. A second example is from The Guardian's journalist, Peter Bradshaw, who regularly uh, criticizes films for being boring. He will often um, uh, lay into particular titles uh, for, uh, for, um, for boring him as a viewer. And this is from his review of The Lone Ranger, the remake of The Lone Ranger starring Army Hammer and Johnny Depp. It really is long, he wrote. I have known movies by the Greek director Theo Angelopoulos and quadruple albums by the band Wishbone Ash that seemed shorter. The director of the film, Gore Verbinski, has surely modified this film's running time using dastardly new temporal distortion technology so that each of its 149 minutes contains 250 seconds. The South American landmass peeled off from the Western seaboard of Africa quicker than this, he said. Now I'm using these examples because they're funny, they're very entertaining, they're a, a nice way for, for us to kind of begin to frame the material today that I'm going to be presenting to you. Um, having said that, although they're entertaining, they do also raise quite interesting points for us. They, they, they raise useful ways of thinking about why films might be boring to somebody. In Roger Ebert's case, he's drawing attention to the fact that a very small and incremental change in detail can make us aware of the fact that nothing is happening in a particular film. And in uh, Peter Bradshaw's case, he's drawing attention to the fact that, that our, our experience of a boring movie might be related to a kind of a, a sense of its temporality being distended, a sense that it's too long, that's, that there's some sort of um, disjunction between the film's time and our own. What I want to do uh, in the course of, of this talk is to take boredom 
seriously. Uh, boredom is often seen as a rather uh, frivolous affect, a frivolous emotion, and I want to actually um, pay attention to it and consider it seriously. And I'm going to divide this talk into two halves. I'm going to set out, set out my stall initially by framing boring movies, and then later on we're going to um, look at some uh, profoundly boring films um, and what it is that those films do and how we would go about experiencing them. In taking boredom seriously, one of the cues that I'm taking is from the writer Kathleen Stewart, who wrote a fantastic book called Ordinary Affects. And Kathleen Stewart uh, says, and I'm just going to quote from her here, she says, ordinary affects are public feelings that begin and end in broad circulation, but they're also the stuff that seemingly intimate lives are made of. They give circuits and flows the form of a life. They can be experienced as a pleasure and a shock, as an empty pause or a dragging undertow, as a sensibility that snaps into place or a profound disorientation. They can be seen as both the pressure points of events or banalities suffered and the trajectories that forces might take if they were to go unchecked. I like this, uh, the way that this is written. It's, it's semi-poetic, but it also gives a sense of why our ordinary emotions, rather than the big ones, the love and the hate, may be worth us paying some attention to. But I also am um, drawing attention to boredom. I'm focusing on boredom, um, partly because uh, I, I'm inspired by writers like Julian uh, Jason Halladin, who argues that boredom is not simply a minor personal problem, but it's rather an affective mode of being that represents a fundamental questioning of culture. I also don't want this talk to itself be boring. That would be terrible. Um, as Henri Lefebvre has written, why should the study of the banal itself be banal? Hopefully we can take boredom seriously and still have quite a good time while we're doing it. I think it's worth just outlining a little bit of historical detail before I get to some of the major writers, including Peter Tui, who have written about boredom. And um, what, I, what I want to start by saying is that um, boredom has a history. It's not something that uh, has always been with us. That might seem like, a, like a, 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 a strange thing to say. You might think that it's a, like many of our emotions, that it's always, um, it's always been around. But boredom, as the writer Joe Moran has noted, is a relatively recent phenomenon. It's a historically constituted feeling which developed with the birth of modernity. In fact, the noun boredom only dates from the 19th century. There were, of course, precedents for modern and contemporary experiences of boredom, which would include things like melancholy and what uh, early Christian writing calls acedia. Um, but as, as the writer Lars Svensson uh, puts it in his tremendous book, A Philosophy of Boredom, these were all predominantly seen as marginal phenomena reserved for monks and nobility. They were a prerogative of the upper echelons of society since they were the only ones with the material basis required for boredom. Writings uh, on boredom, uh, sorry, um, uh, for Walter Benjamin, whose writings on boredom remain a crucial resource on the topic, and I'll come back to Benjamin later on, the 1840s marked the point at which boredom began to, experience, to be experienced in epidemic proportions. Uh, the epidemic has arguably not been cured. As Svensson suggested in 2005, we currently live in a culture of boredom. Despite this historical specificity, much of the theoretical and historical writing about boredom itself agrees that there are specific types of boredom. So let's look at one of these. Let's look at Peter Tui's book here, Boredom, A Lively History, which was only published relatively recently. He identifies that there are two main forms of boredom, simple and complex. Uh, and up on the screen here is a quote from his book um, in which he identifies the differences between these two forms. The first form of boredom, he says, is the result of predictable circumstances that are hard to escape. It's characterized by um, lengthy duration, um, uh, by a sense of inescapability, uh, by a sense of being confined. Uh, by something when you feel like this, when you feel like you're going, you're like you're bored, uh, time seems slow to the point that you feel as though you stand outside of those experiences. This is a simple, everyday, itchy type of boredom, something that we can probably all immediately go, oh yeah, I know, I know what that means. 
The second form of boredom, which is occasionally termed complex or existential boredom, is said to be able to infect a person's very existence, and it may even be thought of as a philosophical sickness. So one of these is kind of every day, it's something quite common. The other is something that happens more rarely, but it certainly has a much more profound effect on us, a much more substantial uh, impact. There is much more critical writing on the second uh, than there is on the first. And in Tui's book, he focuses in much more detail on kind of everyday simple forms of boredom. But this distinction between simple and complex boredom surfaces again and again in the literature on boredom. Patricia Mayer-Spax, who wrote a, a fantastic book on boredom and literature, uses the distinction as well. She segregates the two from each other. But crucially, she highlights that the distinction between simple and complex boredom is class and gender specific. As Joe Moran writes in a gloss of Spax's argument, ennui or the more prof profound sense of boredom is more likely to be experienced by those who can delegate the tedium of mundane tasks to their wives or servants and have the leisure time to dwell on unfulfilled promise. Who is allowed to feel bored? Patricia Spax is asking this question when she looks at, at historical experiences of boredom in literature. She identifies that there are significant differences between particular groups of people depending on their access to leisure time, their access to a disposable income, the amount of free time that they have, and the, the extent to which they can employ people to do some tasks for them, which many of us would consider boring. So a, a, a significant um, thread, if you like, through the literature on boredom is this division into two types, a simple and a complex type, um, which are nuanced in particular ways. I'm going to just throw into the mix here that, that we might need to think a little bit beyond that. There might be a, a wider variety of types of boredom. Maybe the division into two types isn't sufficient. The psychoanalyst Adam Phillips, for instance, has said we should not speak of boredom, but of the boredoms plural, because the notion itself includes a multiplicity of moods and feelings that resist analysis. I'm going to set that aside, though. All right. I'm just kind of throwing that out there so that people are, are aware of that, um, that particular argument. Um, and I'm going to stick to the kind of the, the dualism that is proposed by a lot of writers, because it will help us think about, think about different types of boring movies. In one of the sharpest pieces of writing on cinema and boredom, a short essay by Richard Misek called Dead Time, he upholds the distinction between two types uh, of boredom, or at least two types of boring films, those that kill time and those that bore to death. Misek draws on Heidegger for his theoretical framework. Heidegger's fund fundamental concepts of metaphysics is a book that's made up of the contents of the philosopher's 1929-1930 lecture course, and it contains a hundred pages of reflections on boredom and how it works. Misek calls this the ne plus ultra of boredom, uh, this particular uh, stretch of writing. But he goes into it in some detail. He looks at what Heidegger has to say about boredom and he tries to map it across onto particular types of cinema and the ways in which they operate. Crucially, he highlights that some films that kill time highlight for us the particular experience of killing time. And thus they actually risk boring their audience. Here's a film that's trying to entertain you but it's showing you that, as well as the fact that we might use them to kill time, that characters themselves can also sometimes need to kill time. His example, which, there's a, which is the picture in the background here, uh, is the opening sequence of Sergio Leone's uh, 1968 film, Once Upon a Time in the West, which depicts various characters killing time at a station as they wait for a train to arrive. And if you've seen this film, uh, you'll know the sequence that I mean. Uh, if you haven't seen it, go and watch it. And you can endure the characters themselves killing time as they wait for something to happen. 
For more recent examples of this happening, characters killing time in a film and a director thus risking the possibility of an audience itself being bored, uh, we could look to the films of uh, Sofia Coppola. Um, and in particular, the trilogy that uh, Coppola made around uh, the late 1990s and the start of this century. The Virgin Suicides from 1999, Lost in Translation, 2003, and uh, what this, um, this image is taken from, Marie Antoinette from 2006. All three, of, all three of these films feature young women characters attempting to endure dull circumstances, waiting out dead time. Repeated sequences in Marie Antoinette, for instance, depict the pomp surrounding the laying out of banquets repeatedly. We see the table being laid, extravagant food displays body being put out, the meals start being announced. And then we watch the tortuous interactions between Kirsten Dunst's Antoinette on the right here and Jason Schwartzman's Louis XVI on the left here. The, the fractured conversations that they have, the difficulty that they have of communicating with each other. It's quite, it's quite um, unpleasant viewing, um, but at the same time, it captures the tedium of the life that uh, Antoinette has constructed around her. Alternatively, we could consider several films by Gus Van Sant, uh, films such as Jerry uh, from 2002 or Last Days, in which time stretches out, yawns before characters who struggle to fill it. In Jerry, two young men, played by Matt Damon and Casey Affleck, set out for a hike in the desert, but they get lost. Much of the film follows their wandering as they attempt to find their way back to the highway. And what I'm going to do at this point is to show you three minutes or so from the film.
Okay. Um, I should have said, actually, before I started playing that clip, there was almost no sound. So if you couldn't hear anything, don't worry about it. There's a very minor crunching of feet at one point and somebody very quietly in the final shot, they're shouting, Jerry, just off screen. But if you couldn't hear anything, you're, you're not missing much. Um, the same goes for the, the second clip I'll be showing um, later on. Now, what's uh, useful about this clip here is that it does something very interesting. It's aesthetically beautiful in places, but at the same time, uh, for the audience who's watching the full film, uh, you are experiencing the trials of the two lead characters through lengthy takes, which are often lacking in dialogue. And in fact, the further that the film goes on, the less dialogue there is uh, in the film itself. Uh, the admixture here of formal pleasures, this shot looks lovely, and challenging narrative content, I'm watching somebody trudging across the landscape for, for uh, lengthy, lengthy takes, um, raises a key question for us and for this talk. How can we account for a film that is boring in parts or boring in certain facets, but not in all of them? In fact, is any film ever entirely boring? Um, not if Christian Metz in his book Film Language is correct, uh, in which we, we encounter this uh, particularly fantastic quote, one is almost never totally bored by a movie. Uh, and certainly, the film journalist Manola Dargis um, seems to be backing this up in some of her writing uh, when she is discussing um, Michael Bay's filmmaking. In a review of his 2016 film, 13 Hours, The Secret Soldiers of Benghazi, she wrote that, and I quote, Michael Bay makes big bludgeoning movies stuffed with nonsense, special effects, and military fetishism. And while they are ridiculous, they can be absurdly entertaining when they're not boring you out of your mind. Michael Bay, of course, is also responsible for the Transformers franchise, which was our opening slide at the start of this talk. We have a situation here then that Dodges is identifying that large popcorn movies by a director such as Michael Bay can be simultaneously boring and exciting, or they can be both together at the same time. Um, and it's this combination that can be complicated for us to think through. And yet, wouldn't we expect that large mainstream movies produced by, uh, by major studios after over a century of cinema would have worked out how not to bore us. This is Scott Richmond uh, in another fantastic piece of writing on cinema and boredom in which he uh, uh, pays particular critical attention to Christopher Nolan's film Inception. Why is so much of our contemporary media boring? He writes, the various culture industries that produce the onslaught of boring media must surely have enough expertise and capital to ensure that all, or at least much of its output could be interesting, engaging, substantive, worthwhile, or any antonym to boring that you might choose. And he's raising an interesting question here. There's a large, powerful industry behind the making of these films. Why have they not got to grips with, um, with removing, removing the boredom? If we are bored by a film, then it fails to entertain us, to interest us, even merely to serve as a distraction. And we could in fact say that interest is the diametric opposite of boredom. Entertainment should, definition suggests, be entertaining. It should seduce, immerse, captivate, engross. As Richard Dyer writes in his infamous essay, Entertainment and Utopia, entertainment is a type of performance produced for profit, uh, performed before a generalized audience, the public, by a trained paid group who do nothing else but produce performances which have the sole conscious aim of providing pleasure. As a significant part of their transmedia output, entertainment industries around the world attempt to industrially produce films that entertain. They redeploy existing successful components such as generic forms and specific stars. They employ focus groups, to dissect levels of audience engagement across a film's running time, and they build an architecture of anticipation building teasers, all at significant cost. Screenwriting manuals, which are usually authored by people who have experience of working for major film studios, lay down rules for a film's architecture and content that will, if successful, keep an audience's boredom at bay. 
And yet the finished films made within these industrial parameters regularly fail with audiences and at the box office. Crucially, they may be dismissed as boring by audiences and by critics. Entertainment is intricately enmeshed in complex ways with forms of audience pleasure, with economies of attention and distraction, with shifting understandings of leisure time. The construction of entertainment is always fragile with entertainment's other boredom always necessarily inherent within forms of entertainment on the verge of manifesting. Industrial tools such as focus groups and screen, screenwriting guides may attempt to eradicate boredom or to keep it at bay, but powerful, unruly, ordinary affects cannot be contained by mechanical devices alone. Okay, at this juncture, I want to move from thinking about industrial cinema, mainstream cinema, and the kind of simple forms of boredom that it might generate or fail to get rid of, um, uh, the ways in which it might try to kill time and fail to kill time. I want to think more about, um, about films that are profoundly boring. I want to move away from industrial failures to contain the agitations of ordinary itchy boredom and to consider what we've already identified as the second major form of boredom, profound boredom, and the way in which it manifests in film. So in the remaining time of this talk, I'm going to explore a range of films and their creators in which directors have purposefully engaged with boredom, often with the intention of boring their viewers. The politics of boredom are of significance to these creators. They deploy the moving image to challenge standardized forms of cinematic storytelling, to provoke audiences into alternative encounters with filmic temporality. And in doing so, they can make us reflect on the value or otherwise of being bored. Patrice Petro acknowledges that the debate around the political value of boredom remains unresolved. She writes, and I quote, does boredom involve an uncomfortable yet creative self-consciousness or does it merely reinforce sameness, disinterest and apathy, a resignation to the status quo? Monotony nourishes the new wrote Walter Benjamin in the notes to his unfinished arcades project, where he also remarked that, quote, boredom is the threshold of great deeds. There's a fantastic section of the arcades project, um, which is, uh, was uh, collected um, uh, posthumously, uh, Benjamin's project, uh, in which uh, a great deal of attention is paid to boredom and its operations and how it works. Some 30 years later than Benjamin's writings, the Situationist International declared boredom is always counter-revolutionary. Petro, Patrice Petro puts these into dialogue with each other. The Situationist International thinking that boredom can't be revolutionary. And in contrast, Benjamin's writings from decades uh, before that saying monotony nourishes the new. Boredom itself has radical potential. It can do something for us. Your encounter with boredom can uh, produce a shift in your thinking, a shift in your perception that will alter the way in which you um, experience time and temporality and possibly forms of art that, uh, and, and cinema that experiment with it. Andy Warhol liked boring things and stated so openly. Um, and in fact, there are uh, uh, significant and, um, uh, stretches of his own writing in which he talks about his relationship to boredom and to boring things. His experiments with cinematic minimalism and duration arguably reached a peak with Empire, his eight plus hours uh, long film of the Empire State Building that he made um, in 1964. Jonas Mekas wrote of the challenges of screening Warhol's films, including Eat, which you can see a frame from on screen here, uh, also made in 1964, the same year as Empire. This is Mekas writing about screening Warhol's films. After 10 minutes or so, he said, the impatient ones leave or give up, others resign, and the rest of the show proceeds quietly. Later, from the discussions with the audience, it becomes clear that there is always a period to some five minutes to others 15 to some still longer 
a period of jumping the reality gap, or what we could also call the period of aesthetic weightlessness, a period of adjusting to the aesthetic weightlessness, to the different gravitational pull. From there on, you are floating through your mind. From there on, everything becomes very rich. So the idea that Mechas is, uh, is, uh, is proposing here is that there is a, um, there's a shift in our perception when we're sitting through a film that is especially boring, where we break through a barrier and start to engage with the particular textures of something in a bit more, uh, in, in a different way. It, it opens up a different way of experiencing cinema. Now, if this sounds familiar, it might be because we've come across it in other places. You may have come across it in other places. Uh, the Russian director, Andrei Tarkovsky, for instance, is uh, well known for having said the following. He said, if you, could, if you extend the normal length of a shot in a film first, you get bored. But if you extend it further still, you become interested in it. And if you extend it even more, a new quality, a new intensity of attention is born. You might also hear echoes in this of the writings of John Cage, uh, the uh, musician, um, in his writings on Zen, in particular, in which he talked about holding something for a particular length of time, and the fact that the longer that you hold something, whether it's a musical note, or whether it is, in this instance, the, uh, the length of a film shot, um, then actually your attention will have to recalibrate itself, it'll have to change. I want to move on from Warhol here and talk about a different filmmaker, James Benning. James Benning's filmmaking career began in the 1970s as Warhol's was coming to a close. He has repeatedly across his career explored the impact of minimalist um, tools um, and structuralist tools. He's looked at the structure of fil the films that he's putting together and looked at uh, their organization. He will often use long static shots in, uh, in his films. In his California trilogy, which was shot between 1999 and 2001. Each of the films is constructed from 35 shots. Each shot is exactly two and a half minutes long. Each shot is recorded with a static camera. Sometimes, as with Warhol's uh, film Empire, movement is difficult to discern within the frame. It seems like nothing is happening. Here is a still from, uh, from Sagobi, the third of the films in the California trilogy of a beautiful blue, blue oak tree. Um, and what I'm going to do at this point is to show you the clip, the two and a half minutes of this particular tree. And uh, once again, I need to say uh, that there is, um, there is almost no sound here. So don't be alarmed if you can't hear anything.
Okay. And you can see that from the, the edit into the next shot, how quickly we move from a, from stasis, in fact, into something with more activity, more noise, more drama. Um, although uh, uh, you can go check out the whole film on YouTube. Somebody has very um, kindly put the whole thing up on YouTube should you want to try and grab that and watch it while it's there. Um, the film is also legitimately available via, via DVD should you want to see it that way instead. Um, in an interview with Scott McDonald, uh, James Benning has actually talked very specifically about this shot in, the, in Sugobi. He says, there are shots in Segovi where nothing happens. And you can't show nothing happening in a photograph. You need to see an image over time to know that absolutely nothing is visibly happening. Remember, he asks that shot of the beautiful tree in the fog. Maybe the tree moves a little, but I'm not sure. I've watched it so many times and I've tried to see some movement and I can't find any. But I wouldn't know that if the image were a photograph. In contrast to Roger Ebert being frustrated by nothing happening in the brown bunny, here James Benning seems excited or at least intrigued by the possibility of nothing happening. He makes a vital point that duration and the perception of change in relation to cinema is very different to that of the still image. Our relationship to photography is very different to that of film. And in fact, we could put this into conversation with something that Richard Misek says in his essay, Dead Time, about cinema and boredom. Misek writes, because it imposes duration, cinema is a privileged site of boredom. In contrast, he writes, a photographic exhibition is unlikely to bore. If we do not find a photograph interesting, we can, we can just move on. The duration of our experience of watching a film is, at least in a cinema, not under our control. If the film is two hours long, the experience lasts two hours, unless we're so bored that we walk out of it. Benning has also commented in a um, fantastic 2018 interview that was um, published in Sight and Sound magazine on the idea of watching paint dry. He's actually referring back to the Gene Hackman movie, Night Moves from the mid 1970s, and on the fact that a character refers to a film as being as boring as paint drying. And Benning says, that's something I'd really aspire to. The idea of making a film uh, in which paint is drying. You can watch paint drying. Uh, making a film of wet paint, he says, would be uh, an ambition because you could get to see the slight shifts in tone, color and moisture that would be captured over time in front of the camera lens. He was joking, of course, but he was also serious and he acknowledges this. He was, um, uh, I, I don't think that he had in mind this particular film. Um, Charlie Lyne's extraordinarily lengthy film, Paint Drying from 2015, which you can find online should you want to watch it. Although Charlie Lyne's film illustrates James Benning's point. Lyne's film was also a joke. It was a crowdfunded trick on British film censors who have to sit through every film that has, um, that has paid the appropriate uh, certification fee. But it's also worth taking seriously. Um, here we have a film that is of, or so it claims, of paint drying. It's in the title. It ended up with a U certificate, by the way, if you're interested. Um, but it's worth us reflecting on what it would mean to watch a film in which paint is drying. And fortunately, Erica Balsam has done that for us. Uh, here is Balsam writing about the idea of watching paint dry. Wet paint signs, she writes, are posted because wet paint doesn't look that dissimilar to dry paint, even though it very much is. Watching paint dry is then not a confrontation with pure stasis, but a condition that demands attunement to differences that are barely perceptible, even imperceptible, yet crucial. To watch paint dry, that is, she's making a comparison here with experimental cinema, is to inhabit a different economy of signification and attention. It is to submit to an experience of subtlety that frustrates ingrained norms and demands a recalibration.
which is to say that under the correct circumstances, monotony can potentially nourish the new. That's rather a nice point on which to conclude, I think. So I'll, I'll stop here. But as a very quick coder, I'm aware that some people will have come along to hear me identify very specifically what the most boring film in the world is. I'm sorry to disappoint you. I did consult with Gal Gadot whether Wonder Woman 84 was the most boring movie of the last 12 months, but she wasn't for telling. Thanks very much. I'm very happy to take some questions uh, or to hear responses to some of this material. Thanks so much. That was not boring at all, I have to say, except for the tree, which was a bit dull. That was brilliant. Um, before we go on, um, and there are some questions, but please keep questions coming. I'll just say that next week at the same time, we have a talk on Robert Altman, um, who I, I don't think is boring at all, uh, called The Place, The Thing, Robert Altman in the 1980s. That's on the 13th of October. And then we've got lots of other talks. We've got talks on the Last Witches of England. We've got a talk on, um, uh, we've got talks coming up about Bletchley Park. We've got talks coming up about uh, the painter Holbein. But uh, another film talk that we have coming up is on Friday the 29th of October, so quite close to Halloween, called Appointments with Fear, Horror Films on British Television. So I'm sure that one's going to be great. Okay, we've got a few comments, but uh, please come, them, come more with them. Um, I think um, uh, Philippa says, um, is Jerry intentionally boring? I really like a lot of Van Sant's other films, but that one sounded really terrible. And it's true, <laughs> I remember the reviews at the time, you know, no one liked it, but and so I didn't want to go and see it. But um, but actually, I, I really like all these other films. I mean, even I even like the Psycho remake. So. Uh, yeah, I quite like the Psycho remake as well, because that's a very interesting experiment. Was it intentionally boring? That's a really good question. Um, I think what's what's um, uh, worthy of attention of, uh, in relation to that period in Van Sant's career is he made three films which he sometimes refers to as his death trilogy, Elephant, Jerry, and um, uh, and Last Days, and that's possibly giving away things that happen in the plot of all three movies. What is particularly interesting about Jerry is that, um, is that, Van Sant had come into contact with the making of particular slow cinema directors. And I haven't even talked about slow cinema here as a, as a kind of post 2000 film movement that has its roots in earlier, uh, early experiments. But in particular, he'd been watching films by Bella Tarr, uh, the Hungarian director. And there are shots in Jerry that specifically reference individual shots from Tar's perhaps best known movie, the seven hour long film, Shatan Tango from, I think it was 1994 it was made in. Um, so he was mimicking shots from that and recognizing that the particular um, language of cinema that Tar was using was rarely seen in American film. Tar quite often follows characters with his camera for what seems like too long. Um, he will walk behind people as they are uh, simply progressing down a street, things walking past, uh, things blowing past them, uh, and was interested in the ways in which that could be incorporated into this particular film. There's less of that in both Elephant and Last Days, which are much more narrative in focus. The, the, the plot, if you like, is very much evacuated from Jerry. Uh, it does literally become two people walking around, uh, 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 around a desert. But there is a, a larger cinema of walking that we could talk about here. Films in which people are captured, um, undertaken quite monotonous journeys and the, the film does not cut away from them. I guess the, the, the other thing to say about Van Sant's inspiration in relation to making Jerry is that he'd also been playing computer games. He talked about Jerry as being a combination of um, Bellatar's movies and things like Tomb Raider. Uh, and the fact that when you're playing a computer game, you can't edit, you don't cut away from the character that you're playing. You're stuck with that person all the way through the game that you're playing. So I think he recognized that it was a formal experiment in the same way that the others were and potentially commercially disastrous. And it has to be said, it was commercially disastrous. It cost about three and a half million to make. It took, I think, about 230,000 at the box office. It was seen as a commercial disaster, but it's formally 
very ambitious. And in terms of a kind of indie US uh, piece of filmmaking, it's certainly pushing the boundaries of what people will accept within, um, within kind of indie cinema. Yeah, someone anonymous has said, um, I saw Joey in the cinema and loved it. And I guess part of the appeal is actually just seeing the landscape. It's why mm. everyone said, you must see Nomadland in the cinema, which was mm. true, it was better. But I, I still think I'd have been bored. There's no question about it. Um, uh, someone else anonymous says, um, where do art installation come into this? They're always uh, profoundly boring. Yeah, I think there's a thin line with some of the films that I was talking about in the second half of this talk, the films that, that are kind of more profound boredom films. It's interesting, the boundaries, um, I think the boundaries are porous between some of those films as things to watch in a cinema and things that you might encounter in a gallery. Um, I'm thinking here in particular, I wrote, I wrote an essay a few years ago about an extraordinary film uh, by the director Wang Bing, which is called Crude Oil, which is 14 hours long. And uh, I saw it in a very cold gallery space in Newcastle upon Tyne, um, the Stevenson Gallery. And uh, I, people occasionally wandered in and watched it for a couple of minutes. But the film is, like, if you watch the whole thing, it takes two days to sit through two kind of seven hour uh, stretches. Installations, though, a bit like um, the photographs that I was talking about earlier, you can walk away from. Mm. You can walk into something that's being screened as an installation partway through. You can sample it for a few minutes, but you're very un unlikely to stick with it for the full experience. You get a sense of the concept, but you don't necessarily watch it as you would a, a movie. And a useful example here, in fact, is something like Douglas Gordon's 24-Hour Psycho which slows down Hitchcock's 1960 movie into a 24 hour version of the film so that you can see every single individual frame of the film. Now, you're not going to watch all 24 hours of Douglas Gordon's 24 hour psycho because why would you? you once you've got the idea, you know exactly what's happening. Gordon often experiments with, with durational film experiments in an installation format. He's done much bigger, bolder uh, projects than 24 Hours Psycho, but 24 Hours Psycho is the one that lodged in a lot of people's minds because it was conceptually very rich. Uh, and because it also exposed, if you like, just how beautifully framed and assembled Hitchcock's movie was. But it's an installation you can back away from it. You can simply leave the room if you want to. Uh, you don't necessarily need to spend time in the same place. For anybody that's interested in that particular relationship, there's a fantastic novel by Don DeLillo yeah, called Point... Point... Yeah. Um, the, the, the Point Omega by Don DeLillo actually features a character who goes and spends a lot of time in a gallery with an installation to find out what that durational experience is like. But it's a very different one from actually paying your money, sitting in the cinema and then leaving at the end of the film. Yeah, so I, I interrupted you there because you very slightly froze for a second. But ah. you're back, so hopefully. Um, yeah, Phil Sugden quotes from Ezra Pound, who apparently said everything becomes interesting if you look at look at it long enough which kind of ties into the oak tree thing, that if you look at that long enough, you presume you get a bit obsessive, but is it going to move? Is it going to be a leaf flickering? Is something going to happen? Um, someone anonymous says, I can imagine enjoying the oak tree if I ingested the right substances beforehand. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I can't possibly comment. <laughs> but I think it's an interesting question, that the fact that, there is a big difference between cinema watching things at the cinema and watching things at the telev television because obviously you know the oak tree on television it would be a bit like those people who have who they was a bit of a fan a few years ago for screensavers of um of, of flames um yeah, you know, five it would be a bit like that you you wouldn't sit and watch it you might have it on in the background as a kind of i don't know i don't know why you'd have it on in the back but you wouldn't be watching it properly in the same way with boring films on television you can go make a cup of tea you you know, you can fall asleep. And it is a very Absolutely. different experience. It's quite interesting. It's very different. That, that Ezra Pound quote is fantastic, but it absolutely gets to grips with, with that idea that if you stick with something for a long enough, then your perception might shift. Uh, I, I, I would draw attention here to, to a, a brilliant bit of writing by Justin Remmers, uh, a book called Motionless Pictures, in which he talks about uh, furniture films, uh, films that are like part of the furniture. You're not supposed to sit and look at them all the time. 
but they're films that you should walk. You you might be aware of them. You might be in the room with them, but you wouldn't necessarily look at them. And he uses that idea to talk about Warhol's films. He he argues that you're not supposed to watch uh, all of Andy Warhol's Empire, all eight hours of it or in fact many of his other experiments with minimalism. They should be there, you can engage with them partially should you want to, but actually they should be part of the decor rather than necessarily uh, something that you sit and scrutinize and pay close attention to. Yeah, um, Sahir, I think it's Sahir, sorry, I'm um, peering, peering my glasses here. Isn't boredom subjective though? I was bored out of my head by Captain America's Civil War, but my sister loved it. How do we examine an effect, an emotion that's so so subjective? I think, you know, when you said about Wonder Woman, I'm sure people love that. And I've seen a lot of Star, Star Wars films, and frankly, I can't tell them apart, really. And they're all, you know, I don't know why I keep on going thinking this, this is going to be the one that I'm going to enjoy, because apparently this is the good one. And I can't, I just can't tell them apart. They're just all the same. And, and I'm sure lots of people feel like that about Marvel films. It, it is a difficult one to pin down isn't it with it is absolutely and i think that's why uh, in terms of when, whenever i'm kind of um talking about this subject I, I think it's always very um there's a tendency for people to go oh i'll tell you another film that's really boring um or i'll tell you something that i found really boring and actually i have no interest in telling you an audience what i found boring and similarly because of that that personal response to something um if you like it just becomes a let's exchange our subjective uh, uh, responses with each other. And I think it's also worth saying our responses can change. It might be that something that you couldn't face at one particular point, you might return to later, try again and actually find that, you know, your, your mood has shifted, your, um, your expectations have altered and therefore actually your relationship to the text is different enough that you might enjoy something that you previously found um, uh, unbearable. Um, I don't think that the subjective nature of it, however, means that we can't talk about the experience of boredom in relation to cinema. And that's what I think is useful for us to, to, to negotiate or to, to explore together, which is the interaction between us as an audience and the text. We can't, I don't think, and this is where um, it, Mies, Richard Misek's writing on Heidegger and cinema is really helpful. We can't locate boringness in any individual movie necessarily. But what we can do is identify that particular creators have sometimes strategically said, I'm going to use boredom as a tool, as part of my filmmaking arsenal. With a more mainstream form of cinema, our subjective experiences are, um, are very subjective, they're very individual. But if a lot of people are experiencing a film as being boring, if critics are experiencing a film as being boring, then we need to ask whether something has gone wrong along the way uh, or whether there's, uh, there is something inherent to the ways in which we have constructed our entertainment industry that allow that to happen. Yeah, I mean, it, it is subjective. I mean, a recent one was Annette, which mm. I thought was terrible, but I wasn't bored at all. Um, and I think and a lot of reviewers were very divided on it, but I don't think anyone said it was boring. Um, yeah, and that's a different kind of qualitative distinction, yeah. isn't it? We're, we're actually talking here about the, you know, the, 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 the affective response of something being boring or not boring, I think can be totally separate from being able to judge the quality of a film. You could judge that the quality of something is very good and still not like it. Well, yeah. Duncan Robertson has an interesting question. How do you tell someone politely their films are boring? <laughs> Hi Duncan, nice to see you. Thanks very much for coming. Um, that's a that's a really good question. I would, uh, as a as an educator, I I th I don't think you can ever criticise somebody for what it is that they're trying to do. My approach would always be to ask somebody, "What were you trying to do with this?" Francis says the most boring film I've seen was Gr Grunter, might be Gruntal. However, without a story and characters, I focus on the filming, which was interesting. Mm. I think that's true. Sometimes you just have to think about something else, don't you? Oh, David Lockwood's got a good story. Many years ago, my husband and I, together with a friend, were watching Derek Jarman's In the Shadow of the Sun. The projector broke down, the film stopped. Our friend commented sarcastically, oh, I'll never know what happened now. Little did he know that Jarman was sitting behind us. <laughs> And I was fantastic. thinking about that one, um, Blue, which I guess is a boring film, but an interesting radio, you know, radio broadcast, as it were, but it's not a, it's a boring film. Well, that's a, that's but an interesting question. 
isn't yeah. it? As in, when you, um, uh, if you're of a certain vintage and you remember that being aired initially, it was simultaneously broadcast with a radio. Uh, yes. Uh, Yes, I in, in kind of radio format. And okay. the film image itself obviously does not change all the way through, but it does invite us to reflect on the role of the visual in relation yeah. to the audio visual. Yeah, for those that don't remember, Derek John's blue, it was just a blue screen with various monologues over it. And yes, it was shown on Channel 4, wasn't it? And it was shown yeah, on that's right. Radio 3 or something. It was on Radio yeah. 3. Um, the idea of um, Neil... Uh, Conlock, the idea of boring films being part of the furniture, similar to Brian Eno's original idea of ambient music, i.e. the music you don't have to pay much attention to. Absolutely. But it's quite different because you have to be looking at the film. I mean, films you're still meant to be looking at. Music, you can wander around. You can, you're not going to trip over the furniture. You're not going to trip over the real furniture if you wander around not listening to the music. But films, you have to kind of have some sort of looking at them, don't you? It is a, it's a bit different, but it's... Um, I think there's a. I think that's a really useful uh, contrast, actually, or, or um, a really helpful. They're two very different things, but they're really. Uh, it can be really provocative to bring them into conversation with each other. Ambient music, certainly, especially in Eno's formulation, is something that can be there. Is there to possibly be paid attention to? It might emerge suddenly into our consciousness. We might become aware of it, but a lot of the time, it's just there to kind of fill the space around us. Um, in fact, to, in in his original formulation, of course, it's almost indistinguishable from the from the sounds of the room in which it's it's being uh, it's being played. Um, but the, the furniture film uh, formulation that Justin Remus uses, it depends on a very particular kind of screening space. It wouldn't work in your multiplex, for instance, but if you had a film screening on a wall in a space where there were other things going on, there was a party happening, for instance, then it would be just one element of, um, of, what, of the whole uh, environment. Yeah, and this is always a slightly odd thing, that business of films that are there that you're not watching properly, like, you know, if there's a a football match in the pub that you're not actually concentrating on but you're still yeah. drawn to every so often it's yeah. and i'm sure if, if you were watching a furniture film or paint dry just every so often if, if that was on the pub i'm sure you you'd every so often just find that people were just looking at it you know that everyone, absolutely is, it, is the is the paint going to dry is it going to drip it's going to and then it all go back to their normal you know drinking and things it, it would be an odd communal experience i think yeah i mean we do have kind of um we have standard ways of interacting with particular types of screens, don't we? And uh, it's often been said in television studies, for instance, that we don't watch TV, the TV screen with anywhere near the same level of attention, visual attention that we would watch uh, watch the big screen. I think with the increasing size of TVs over the years, that, that, that distinction has become a bit, a bit um, fungible, actually, a bit messy. Uh, but the idea that you would glance at TV or you would do other things while things were happening on, on the television screen still does stand. Yes, do you, I mean, do you think... Our I mean, it's a bit of a cliche, isn't it? Our boredom threshold has changed because once you would have, someone who liked films would have just thought, Monday evening, I'm going to go to my local cinema and I'm going to stay there from six o'clock till they kick me out and just watch whatever's ever's on because that's the only way I can see moving pictures on a screen. Whereas now television, it, however big your television is, lots of, most people have like their knitting or a book or a laptop or something else. Yeah, and actually, Nikki, one of the quotes that I took out of this this talk, um, just because I had too much content in there, uh, was a quote by Simon Reynolds from his book Retromania, in which he talks about the changes in our experiences of boredom over the course of the 20th century. He feels a certain nostalgia for the boredom that he had in the 70s and the 80s as a kid when there was actually a lack of things to do. There weren't as many TV channels, you know, there, was, there wasn't as much on the radio. Um, and now he says his boredom comes from a surfeit of material. There's too much for us to choose from. The endless archive of YouTube, endless Netflix material, blah, 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 means that actually when we feel boredom now, it's qualitatively different to what it would have been like several decades ago. And I think that shift is also really interesting to think through. Well, I think we all remember a time when you kind of gave programmes a chance. Yeah. You know, if you were in on, a, on eight o'clock on Monday evening and you wanted to watch telly, you, whatever it was, you would give it a couple, two or three episodes before you gave up. Whereas obviously now you flick over to your 8,000 other possibilities. And I After think 10 minutes, you just go, I'm done. It's not working. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah, and I'm I'm probably as terrible about that as everybody. It's it's I mean it's a, it is a it is a shame. It's a kind of loss, I think. Um, 
anti and, and someone else anti-christ got rave reviews but i found it extremely boring i couldn't mm. empathize with any of the characters i don't know anti-christ mm. lars von trier movie yeah oh um, yeah okay got you oh the really violent one yeah got you um so both viol- that's a difficult combination isn't it when things are both really violent and, and upsetting but also boring yeah, but but also, you know, interesting to compare them because they're both, in inverted commas, unwatchable in one way or another. And that's a category that I didn't unpack, especially just, again, because of time limits. But there's a, there's a fascinating discussion to have around what people conceive of as unwatchable. Maybe to return to the comment about things being subjective, I think all viewers have their limits in terms of what it is that they will that they will sit through um, and recognize themselves. Okay, I can't go there, or I can try this, but that's as far as it will go. There was a, a, a brilliant collection of essays, actually called Unwatchable, that came out a few years ago, edited by um, uh, four separate, four different editors, um, which is well worth having a look at in this in this respect, um, and actually does contain some pieces, including that Erica Balsam essay that I mentioned earlier yes i mean you're presuming of an age that you remember that that book by the medford brothers the worst movies ever made yeah it was that actually they actually weren't they they might be not very good movies might be low budget movies that are terrible but actually they weren't boring i mean they're all kind of earth versus the flying saucer people and Mm. stuff like that but they they weren't boring they were just cheap movies but they you know pass the time for an hour and a half they weren't like this at all and that's a different category just yeah. one sort of last question here from deborah jackson i remember vaguely something mark fisher wrote about having a compulsion towards boredom can you say mm. something about the relationship i guess that ties in with what you were just saying that we have too much sensory overload yeah absolutely hey deborah nice to see you thanks very much for coming yeah mark fisher's actually got some really interesting things to say about about um our relationship to to boredom um, one of the points that I, again, that I didn't make in relation to this talk is um, is the, the kind of increase in writings and attention being paid to boredom by critics that comes with the new millennium. And in Fisher's case, um, it's fascinating to position that in relation to what some writers have called accelerationism. So the idea that things are going too fast and that boredom can be useful for us because it offers a respite from that. It gives us a bit of a breather. People search out slow things, dull things, because actually it takes us out of the hectic pace of modern life it offers us a kind of a balm of some sort an escape okay i think we should round up here here just in answer to one question that was posted someone asked about whether we have a mailing list and we do you'll all be sent uh, an email after this um giving you a link to the recording should you want to watch again but also giving you um, a link to where you can see our other events listed and to our monthly mailing list because we have some great stuff coming up. I mean, as well as lectures like this, we do have things, do have more traditional library things like book groups. And you may want to join our knitting club, for example, or you may want to learn Chinese, but we can also do help you with that. So thank you so much, Glenn. That was absolutely brilliant. Um, thank you. And thank you all for coming and good night.